Our next presenter is Michael Landman. Um, um, so, uh, uh, Michael's um, academic supervisor on this project is uh, Professor Warren Mansell um, from um, uh, what's the school? It's called, it's called Population Health, and particularly the area of psychology. And that's where uh, Michael will be doing um, his PhD in psychology. Um, and the project is. Um, specifically in consciousness and, and the rate at which people control the integration of novel information. Um, and uh, um, this project's kindly supported from uh, uh, Professor Mansell's uh, fund. Good day, everyone. As Andrew suggested, I am Michael, Warren, and Wesley. This is my presentation on information integration, immersion, and how we can build a practical measure of consciousness. This is a lovely group photo we took. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we've gotten quite close um, over this 10 week period. Uh, Warren has introduced me to a really special theory that's transformed or is transforming the way I look at psychology in very important ways. And, uh, and he's been able to hold space for my intellectual freedom, but also uh, tell me when I'm on the wrong track, and that's been really useful. Uh, and, uh, and Wesley is an absolute wizard. Um, I figured out over the last 10 weeks, uh, and has shown me many magic tricks that I will continue to use in my PhD moving forward. Oh, the other thing about Wesley that I really love that I pointed out, I figured out early, was that he's such a great teacher. Like he's, he really makes you feel like learning from him is easy and not many people can do that and I really appreciate that. Cheers Wes. So an unambitious question, what is consciousness? A little bit of tongue in cheek. Um, but it is also part of my point in, in that it's, it's, a, it's a really hard abstract uh, question and it's, it, it seems to have led to a lot of theories that aren't practical and it's, it's highly theoretical, highly mathematical and there's not much practical application. So Warren's published a paper with an intention to, to keep it pretty pra practical, to keep it uh, within, to, 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 to produce a theory that enables us to work with people in better ways. Uh, so it's actually useful for the end user of a theory. And rather than, and it's really recentering why we're doing science, like who, who are we doing science for at the end of the day? I think it's better to produce interventions that actually make a difference. And that's one of the reasons why I like the way he's put forward this model. The other, apart from utility, there's also measurement. So we want to produce a theory of consciousness that can can be measured because that enables us to say whether this theory of consciousness is on the right track, whether it's true or not. It needs to be what's called falsifiable. Uh, and the other point about the, what, what, uh, why, why this theory of consciousness that we're going to put forward is, is pretty sound is because it's based in solid psychological evidence. What do I mean by that? I mean perceptual control theory. So perceptual control theory is best explained with a diagram, which is why I'm ch I've chosen this format here. Simple behavior, such as drinking tea, can be broken down into the mechanics of the behavior, which is the control of perception. So you'll notice as I initiate the illustration, the person on the screen is controlling for the perceptual variable that is the cup. And so the error between, the difference between where the cup is and where the individual wants the cup to be will generate the output, which is the, the action in the arm. So you'll see the cup is moving, the person is moving the cup, but that's based on the perceptual information that is being received. So behavior is the control of perception. That's the core idea. This consciousness model is nested within that theory. So, sticking to this theme of controlling perceptions, consciousness is 
the perceptual control of the rate at which we take in information. And that, so we t we're always taking in information, but consciousness is the control of that rate. This also la leads us to ask ourselves the question, what is information? Uh, it can be a number of things, but it is pretty, it, it's, it's helpful if you simplify it as there's, a se there's an information landscape outside of each of us, and we are able to access information through our five senses, but also through cognition, through thinking. So it's, a, it's how it's, we can get information through sight, hearing, feeling, smell, taste, and thinking. But, okay, so I've got, we've got all this information coming from different sources. How do we, how do we put it together? How do, we, how do we make sure it all creates a cohesive sense of consciousness? Why don't we just get a bombardment of different information? And how do we actually make sense of reality? We all live a coherent existence. So how is this, or well, some more than others, which is, I'll get to that later. <laughs> I heard you could go there. <laughs> But that, that is part of the point. What, how, how come some live more coherent lives than others? And to what extent does, can this theory account for that? So we do integrate the information that we, we do integrate the information that we, uh, that, it, that is coming through. I've explained that verbally, but I'd like to, everyone just to experience that now together. So the best way to do that is to close your eyes and those online as well, I'd love, I'd love you to join in with us and we'll do that collectively. So please close your eyes and maintain silence for 15 seconds starting now. Let's time up. That worked better than I thought. Brilliant. So let's recall some of the information while it's fresh in our mind. So in one or two words, I'd love to get some, some feedback from the crowd. This isn't a rhetorical question that I actually do want people to contribute here. We'll start with seeing. What did people see? And just, by the way, for those closed eyes, you can open them. Um, what did we see then? One or two words. Explain it to me. Darkness. Darkness? Colors in the eyelids. Colors in the eyelids? Okay, not much. We had our eyes closed. Even though we had our eyes closed, it is curious that you can still take in information, right? Hearing? Much the same. It was a silent room. Did anyone have any information cross their mind? Air conditioning? Okay. Were you aware of that before you closed your eyes? Yeah, you were? Okay, interesting. Feeling, did anyone, beyond, I mean, the feeling is interesting, because I, I, I mean touch here as well, but feeling is also associated with emotions, and that's, that's got a cognitive component, but what do people feel in that 15 second period? Right? Yeah, right, right. So you might, yeah, yeah, it's a wandering mind. The information continues. Any other? Pardon? Vulnerable? I thought you might have made a really intense noise, so I was Yeah, right, okay. Were you, what about smell, taste, and thinking? Anyone have any information that they would feel that they would want to share? Yeah, okay, like when is he going to stop this stupid demonstration, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, and did that information come to you or did you control it? Was it volitional? Somewhere between. Right, yeah, so okay. It started without me, and then I was like, well, I'm Yeah, so we can do both, but yeah, we can, it's a, that's, that's where it gets really interesting. So the idea there was, the purpose of that was so we can, you, you practice there controlling the information that you were integrating. That's what we were all doing. We were using our consciousness 
to regulate the information that was coming through to each one of us because we, we closed our eyes and we maintained silence. That also had the other effect of increasing awareness of other senses. So the takeaways here are that we're always taking in information and making sense of that information as we take it in, as long as we are conscious. We, the second point is that we actually control that rate of information as it comes through into us. What you're about to see is a, a live recording, uh, sorry, not live recording, but a recording of a participant experiencing my or our virtual reality paradigm that is testing this model of consciousness. So I'll explain it once you experience it, once again. So what you can see here on the screen is a, a color landscape. The reason why I've chosen a color landscape is because it doesn't contain any symbolic information, or I've reduced the extent. It does. We figured out later that some people like rainbows more than others, but uh, <laughs> that was unfortunate. But uh, you can't completely eliminate any symbols. It's, it's very difficult. Um, and, but but what, the key, what the key part of that is, <clears throat> is that the information is changing. And so the information is changing only when the individual moves around their environment. So they explore it. And that, that the information that they experience as they, as they change their environment is a measurable change. And so that enables us to capture this, this measure of consciousness. You also note that you heard the sound, so the sound is increasing pitch. So we've got a visual array that's changing, which is increasing in frequency of color. We've also got increasing of saturation of color, um, and we've got increasing of the pitch. Two really interesting findings from just trying to put together a measure of consciousness is that we have, we initially thought brightness and volume would be, would be good to add, but it, it turns out that brightness and volume are, are not necessarily information. Um, maybe retrospectively that's kind of obvious, but it's, they're more like precursors to information. So you can't actually experience information, audio information, with an absence of volume. If, it's, if volume is zero, no audio. If brightness is zero, no vision. So as I just suggested, we've got sight and hearing primarily, that mainly suits, that's, that's mainly for the purpose of, uh, or the reason why we have that is because virtual reality lends itself to those sensory modalities. Throughout this project, uh, we've been building the VR paradigm iteratively. So at the, right at the beginning, I took this to heart when Wes said, always try and produce a product that is that can be completed, but can always you can always add a little bit more to it. So you will end up with something that's finished, but you can always add components as you go. And the way I was adding components was I was testing it as I was going, and it would give us ideas every week that we would have a meeting. So that's also a moment for me to thank all my friends and family for, for being a part of that, including my grandmother. <laughs> Um, so a third person perspective of what we were just experiencing then with the restricted field of view. So this is looking from within the software builder called Unity. So the camera resembles the individual's uh, vision and that's pointing through a hole in a opaque sphere. Within a larger sphere which contains the information landscape that has been constructed on Photoshop. The output uh, is, is in its infancy. The analysis of this, of this measure is, 
it will be complex um, and it will take a while to unpack fully. Right now, we are able to capture two important variables. One is the angle that you're looking within the sphere. So we've combined all, it's, it's called a quaternion angle, but it's pretty much just the, the angle between two other angles. So there's always going to be one angle that's the distance from the center point to wherever you currently are. So we've got that angle, that gives us one piece of information. Because as someone travels across that gradient, there will always be a change of information. That's how we've designed the inside of the sphere. We also have speed, because if, we're, if we've got multiple time points across which we're taking in that angle, we've got the speed of change. So those are two variables that we're playing with at the moment that will give us a rate of information that people are integrating at any one moment. As you can see here, here's a rudimentary graph of, again, the same participant that you saw earlier. So for future research, and I hope to be part of a fair amount of this, will be to first off develop this headset and the paradigm a little bit further. So we, we have, most of this is actually at our, at our fingertips. We, we, it won't take too long because a lot of the groundwork has already been done. Eye tracking is already a, a, a function that's available to us. It just needs to be uh, to, to be made available within the headset. We've also got pupillometry that fits within that category, which is the measurement of your pupil size that has psychological inferences that are useful. Uh, haptic feedback, which is just touch, vibration. Adding that to the list of information that's changing for people will be quite, quite uh, Quite helpful. I think it's going it, to, it, the, the more sensors that we have at once, actually, it's not, it's not a linear improvement. It's actually a little bit, it, it's a little bit better than that. It's because you, it, you're integrating multiple modalities of sensors. And there's a, there's a real beauty to the more, the merrier, really. And visual complexity of the information landscape. We need to make it a little bit more complex. Again, like I mentioned earlier, we need to refine the output in the analysis. We've got a few mathematical ideas surrounding that. And hypothesis testing, starting with undergraduate samples. So just to leave, leave you guys on, an, on the important note of why, why this is a cool project, why, why I'm passionate about this, and why I was so keen to sign up for 10 weeks of my holidays to be here and do this. I've, I've loved this. Um, the, no, if you have a higher integration rate, doesn't mean you're better. If you have a lower, doesn't mean anything. Right? It's valueless. What the important thing is, is your ability to regulate your information rate within the parameters that you see as desirable. And so if, if you are unable to regulate your information rate, uh, we propose that that has psychological um, negative connotations. So it's, it's, not, it's not as good. Uh, but that's a testable hypothesis so of consciousness. And uh, so my acknowledgments here as well, they're really important. Again, Warren for bringing me aboard. Wesley for, uh, for being a wizard. Andrew and Carly for putting up with me. And Shing and Gabe for really helping out on the coding side of things. Uh, it's completely new to me and I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening.